Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to see you all here this morning on this kind of gray Sunday morning, but it's a nice, cool Sunday. Uh, it's beautiful. It's wonderful to see you all here. It's great to be alive. I bring you greetings from uh, the Wisconsin Conference. Yesterday, the delegates and I were up there for the day, um, partook in many workshops, which we'll be sharing with you later. Uh, and letting you know what's going on with the meetings. Uh, it was a great experience, and we thank you for being with us in your prayers. I'd also like to remind you that this Sunday, Cindy Ritter is representing us up at Camp Awesome as one of the volunteers up at Moon Beach, uh, working with autistic children and their family. Please keep her in your prayers this week as well. I'd like for you to uh, remind you about, um, let's see, wait a minute. Next week is our drive-in. It's our drive-in worship service. Following the drive-in worship service in the fellowship hall. Some people were a little confused about that. In the fellowship hall, there will be a roundtable discussion about what's going on in the driveway, in the parking lot, and also the property that someone has approached us that they want to purchase that's part of our property here at the church. Uh, so be sure and check that out. There's displays at both entrances. I know Paul and Clarence Plus are available. If you have any questions, ask them now. They'd like to have some questions that they can bring you answers next week if they have to. But anyway, this roundtable discussion is very important because that way you can clear a lot of the questions. And when we get ready to vote on this at the last Sunday meeting, then we can do it expediently. And we can actually have answers to questions that we don't have answers to the 19th. So be sure and come to that if you're interested. <clears throat> um, I'd like to draw your attention to the Cobblewurst sale. If you like Cobblewurst, you can still get Cobblewurst, the frozen Cobblewurst. This is the same recipe that we serve here at our Cobblewurst dinner. Clarence Plus and his family have, have offered some up for a donation to the parking lot fund. It's $13 a ring. And what we've been doing in the past is you just call through the week and then Clarence will bring some in. Right now, there's some people that have had, got some on order, and he's ready to serve them. Um, I think we may be able to have some available just walk-in following this Sunday, but not this Sunday, maybe the next Sunday. Let's see, what else do I need to cover? Prayers. I'd like for you to pray for a lot of people. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on. All the trouble in the Ukraine, uh, I'd like you to continue your prayers for David Zerflu. They're working. He's healing. Uh, he's home. Uh, he is, was still on oxygen the last I talked to him, but it would be good for prayers for him. That would be hard to stay home and be kind of, uh, what do you call that? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, it's hard for him to be at home. Um, let's see, what else do I need? Uh, uh, David's... Uh, Dwayne Godfrey, Hans Salzer, uh, Pansy Boleen has some tests tomorrow. We'll pray for good results for her as well. Continued prayers for Alton Sherman and Dave Bloom that their health continues. Their good health continues. They're... So, <clears throat> let's see. Prayers for Melissa Trumpy as well. We got a lot of prayers, don't we? We still don't know anything about her. I'd like to send up some prayers of thanksgiving for our very special music today. Julie Minor Pope Pofel is here with us to share her gifts. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Giver, steward, and guide, may the gifts we bring magnify beyond the boundaries of our community to create new possibilities in the world. There'll be a offering basket at each one of the exits. As you leave, you can leave your tithes and offerings there. If you'd like to f understand how else you can help support the church, or if you'd like to make a donation online, this is the address right here on your screen. Uh, if you have any questions or have trouble with that, give us a call at the office, and uh, we can make sure that that all happens and give you ways that you can be part of our community. Let's pray for these gifts that we're about to, to give, to dedicate to the church. 
Generous, abundant, and precious God, bless our offerings of presence, ability, and resources as we participate as co-creators in your new kingdom. Amen. Now, my favorite part of the service is to say the Lord is with you. Now let us worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our service of prayers today for Trinity Sunday were written by Reverend Dr. Cheryl A. Lindsay, Minister for Worship and Theology with the United Church of Christ and published on the Worship Ways page of the UCC.org website. If you'll join me in the responsive call to worship. Wisdom calls and understanding speaks. Majestic God, we recognize your voice. Creation declares your glory and humanity marvels at your care. Merciful God, we rejoice at your works. Peace, endurance, character, and hope are gifts. Mysterious God, we receive your love in thanksgiving. Let us pray. God, our potter, God who becomes clay, God who shapes us in the fire. We are made new in your presence. We come seeking your wisdom, crying out our concerns, needing your peace. Use this time to form us as a community, connected through your breath, life, and hope that propels us as your body in the world. Amen. Let's stand.
don't know whether we have one child, but I don't know whether she'll come up. Would you like to come up and talk to me for a little bit? You don't have to if you don't want to. I understand. But you, you sure you don't want to come up and talk a little bit? Okay. Well, I'll talk to you all. What I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to close your eyes. I'd like for you to think about God. What's that? What's God look like? Think about God. If you were going to describe God, what would God look like? Just think about that for a minute. Okay, now I want you to just like one word shout out, you know, like, like something, one or two words, and just shout them out. What does God look like? What does that vision look like? Human light, shining, sun, friend. Well, this has always perplexed people. How do you explain something like God? God is massive. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today, trying to explain the unexplainable and how the early church tried to go about that and where these concepts came about. I think we have a slide up here I'd like to show you. It's kind of like these monks and the elephant, right? It's like wherever we can sense God, wherever each one of us, you know, each one of these blind monks, like the one that's feeling the trunk thinks the elephant looks like a snake. And the one feeling the ears thinks it looks like a giant fan. And the one feeling the tusk thinks it, it looks like a spear. And the one feeling the side thinks it looks like a big wall. And the one feeling the tail, oh my gosh, it's a little snake. It's kind of that way with God. Because each one of us, each time we think about God, each time we interact with God, each time we go into relationship with God, it might be a little different scenario. We might be receiving or experiencing God in different ways. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's have a prayer. Oh, Holy One, we thank you for this time to be able to come together to worship you. Praise God that you are bigger than any of us can even imagine. Praise God that your power is greater than anything we could even conceive of. And praise God that you are not a God that's in a box, that you are everywhere and always and with us, beside us, around us, within us. Amen. I did very well this morning. Here I thought we were cruising along pretty good without any mistakes. <laughs> Should have known better, huh? I forgot to put the scripture up here. So we'll read it to you. Fortunately, I have a Bible just for such an occasion. All right. Today's gospel text comes from the gospel of John. John 16, 12 through 15. And this is Jesus speaking. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And he will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So ends the reading of our scripture. Amen. sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Through many days 
and grace will lead me home when we titled this sermon, Lucy, you got some splaining to do, because it's kind of a hard thing to understand. Hard for me to wrap my head around it, listen to a bunch of commentaries and try to explain it. This is Trinity Sunday, a feast that came about trying to explain the unexplainable. It seems we get the term, the Trinity, we kind of understand three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the concepts of those three beings being separate and still being one, it's hard for us to make any worldly comparisons because there's nothing in the world like it. Praise God. But there's nothing like God that we can compare it to. God is like is uncomparable. It seems we as humans, in an effort to find out just who is right and who is wrong. You know, that's something that seems to haunt us throughout our history. Like, we have to have everything black and white. We have to have a boundary. We have to have a line. We have to draw a line in the sand. We've struggled with this concept of trying to wrap our heads around the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son thing. It's just kind of, hmm. So today I want to take us back, back in the days of Constantine and the early church way back in the mid-300s A.D., there was a fellow named Constantine who wanted to be emperor. Wow, aspirations of great things. Rome was an empire that made up a vast majority of the territory of all Eastern and Western Europe, as well as most of North Africa and what we call now the Middle East. It was what the Romans and all the people of the Mediterranean believed was the quote unquote, known world to be. This fellow, this Constantine, whom I'm talking about, was a warrior and a battle strategist. He sought to assume the rule of Rome through battle. That's the way to the throne for most emperors back in those days. If you wanted it and were strong enough to take it, (laughs) you got it. So much for elections, right? And it took away from all that propaganda that we see when people try to get elected. Just go and take it. If you're strong enough to hold it, then it's yours. He sought to assume the rule of Rome through a battle that was, that was a way to the throne. But before his greatest battle, though, the Battle of Milvan Bridge, he had a dream. He dreamed that if he put that banner, that that symbol right there, the chi and the rho, which are the Greek letters, that's the initials of Christ in Greek. I know we don't speak Greek, but I'm sure you've seen this P and this X many times. If you've been in any mainline church, you've seen that image, that symbol, and kind of maybe you wondered what it was. Maybe you didn't care. Maybe you were focused on other things at the time. But that's what that means. That's Christ's initials. And it was a symbol of the Christian faith back then. Now the Christians were wandering all over the empire. But they were kind of underground. You know, they weren't really... uh, uh, Let's see, I'm not sure how you say this, but they're not... 
They had to hide. They had to hide because they'd been persecuted before. They'd been persecuted by the Jewish faith. They'd been persecuted by the Romans. They'd been persecuted by each other. All in power struggles and all in that who's right and who's wrong thing. Which usually doesn't have much to do with who's right and what's wrong. It's all about who wants to have the power. So Constantine had this dream that if he put that on a banner and put it in front of his army, that he would win the Battle of Milton Bridge. And so he did. And all the Christians in the empire saw that symbol and rallied behind Constantine. And guess what? He won. And since he won, he thought, that's great. That's awesome. I'm going to make Rome anew. The whole empire of Rome will be Christian from now on. That will be the state religion, a theocracy. If you claim to be a Roman, then therefore you are Christian. You can't be a Roman citizen unless you are Christian. And that was part of how he ruled Rome was through the church, through the church and also through, you know, the might of the state. But Constantine went all over Europe and, and built these massive basilicas there were all kinds of cathedrals all over Europe and all the major cities that proclaimed the Roman Empire and Christ. Notice the order I put those in, because I think that was more what it was like. It was interesting. And under Constantine's rule, the church flourished. And a lot of the things that we know of as church you know, like the bells ringing. The very shape of this sanctuary came about during that time when they were building those cathedrals. It's in the shape of a cross. I don't know whether you ever noticed it or not. But that aisle way is a big cross. This is the holiest of holies, and this is part of the temple, and all the symbols and all this stuff. The stole, the robe. All that came about during this time of Constantine. Constantine wanted all of his priests, which they were employees of the state, you see, to look like the elite. And so they wore the robes of the elite. And so that's where all that came from. All these vestiges of the church and all these things that have been handed down, even to us as Protestants, probably more than we actually want to admit it. All these things come from the Holy Roman Church. It's interesting. And the problem was, you know, he almost had complete control because he had state and he had everybody's spirit under control. And that's being kind of mean. Benefit of the doubt, he was trying to unite everybody and trying to build the church, which could possibly be as well. But in doing so, he had some people that had different ideas. There were only a few people, a handful of people that had access to the scriptures, that had access to all the written parts of the Christian faith. And a lot of them were in this little town called Alexandria, which was the known center of the known knowledge universe of the time. It's like if you wanted to learn something, you went to the Library of Alexandria and studied with the scholars. And so you might have guessed that people are reading these scriptures and they're coming up with their own ideas about things. And each one of those ideas could be a threat to the whole. You know, something new kind of challenges what's old. It always does. Established versus new. What's going to unite us as a people? Because Constantine was trying to unite the entire world as he knew it. So Constantine invited all the bishops of all the churches in all the cities throughout the realm. I think there were like 88 of them. And they came together and they had discussions. They had several councils. And in one of them, they decided on the nature of Christ. You know, they decided on things about what books would be in the Bible 
They decided what, what rituals they would carry, what symbols would mean this, how many angels could dance on the head of a pen, all kinds of different things. They decided as a church. So that became law. That became the way that it was. And that's where most of our rituals and traditions come from. And one of the problems was, how do we share this omnipotent, omnipresent God? How can we package it in the body of somebody like Jesus, a ragtag carpenter's son in the Middle East, running around barefoot with fishermen and prostitutes? And what happens when he's resurrected? What happens when he goes through that crucify, crucifixion story and, and, and is resurrected? How does that, all that play out? How can we explain all that? How can we worship one God that can be apparent in all these places and have all these attributes at once? You know, we see the God as all-powerful, creator, birther, the one who sets the clock of life in the motion. That's the very first God that we see in the Bible. Then we see the one whom Jesus refers to as the father, the life giver. We also see this being known as the body of Christ, the body of Jesus. It's talked about in the New Testament, the promised one, the Messiah, the sacrificial lamb that teaches us how to live a life for those around us. Wow, that's pretty wild. Teaches us the essence of forgiveness an unconditional love of the one for whom this new blossoming faith is pledged. To the Father, the one whom John says was there at very creation in the beginning, the word of God made flesh. And lastly, but definitely not least, this being that Jesus promised to send us, this Holy Spirit, you know, the one we talked about all last week. For about an hour, I went off up here about Pentecost and about the Holy Spirit and how it moves us, flows through us. The wind, the action of God, the being that compels and moves the world to speed the coming of the kingdom of God. You can just about imagine where this left the early church fathers who uh, would rather like to have everything neat and tidy in a box you know, labeled like the mechanics, you know, like their pegboards, you know, that have the outline of the tool so you can put it right up there. You know where it is. And if it's not there, you know it's not there. Perhaps boundaries that, that attempt to say who is right and who is wrong. Who is us and who is them. Who are God's children and who are God's enemies. People have a yearning to feel that they're right right and within these boundaries. What's right? I want to be on the right side of that line, the correct side of that line. It's interesting, these two church theologians from Alexandria, they, they came up with these two concepts about this thing, this Godhead, how to explain this to the people in one sentence or less. A fellow named Arius he decided that Jesus was the son of God. He was created by God. And that's what he was proposed, that Jesus came after God. But that doesn't, that doesn't quite work very well with some things. It doesn't work well with John. The Gospel of John it kind of blows that out of the water because the word was with God in the beginning. And Jesus was the word made flesh. So this other fellow, his name was Athanasius, he decided to come up with a different theory. And his theory was that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three persons, three persons of the Trinity. And the first section of this idea divides the divine attributes, each one individually. Thus, each person of the Trinity is described as uncreated, limitless, eternal, omnipotent, while describing the divine attributes and the divinity of each of the Trinity, he was trying to avoid this hierarchy of one being higher than the other, 
one being more important, like the Father, more important than the Son, or the Spirit more important than the Father. How do you figure that? So the Athanasius and this whole thing was trying to avoid triism, which was like three gods, which we kind of get in trouble with our Muslim brothers over that, because they think we worship three gods. And trying to figure out how there could be this separate, these three separate entities and still be one. And it was interesting. So we had the Athanasius Creed, which was developed by this council that Constantine put together. This discussion of who's right started 1,600 years ago, and I'd be willing to bet that there's people in here that have all kinds of different concepts about the way God relates to them and all different ways of thinking about this word called Trinity. You know, some of you may think it's like water. You know, water can be liquid, it can be solid, it can be a gas, but it's still water. Well, that's a heresy called modalism. So, I mean, you, you just, and it seems like any time we try to get something worldly to explain this Trinity, we get lost. It turns into some kind of heresy. So all these bishops agreed on the Athanasian Creed. They put this thing in play that was supposed to describe this thing that we call a generic word. This being we call God. It's not a specific word. It's pretty generic. It's God. So Constantine's bishop from all the cities decided on the Athanasian Trinity doctrine, and it became a creed. So all those according to the doctrine who did not believe in this manner or who taught something different were heretics. Hmm. We, the Christian church, have burned an awful lot of people that we labeled heretics. The creed would be recited by churches who subscribed to the Trinity from that point forward, and those who believed different were enemies of the church. Wow, the use of creeds to exclude people. You know, that's one of the reasons when the United Church of Christ was put together that they decided to be a non-creedal church because they thought these creeds wielded an awful lot of power against a lot of people who were basically powerless, who were just trying to do the right thing. We as the United Church of Christ have things that we believe in, and we profess them not as creeds, but as statements of faith. This is what we believe. This is what we agree to believe. This is not what you have to believe. That's the way it's worded. Check it out. It's a little bit different than you think. It's interesting. There's so many different ways and so many different ways of viewing this being called God. So many different ways of plugging in and so many different connections to the Godhead. Sometimes we connect in different ways at different times. I know when I'm sad and I'm hurting, I, I really want to talk to that Jesus. I really want to talk to him because I know he's been through it when I want something all-powerful to bring me out of some kind of darkness or evil or something, I call on the creator God. The God that can spin all this and put all this into play must have the power to fix anything. And then I pray for the spirit to come through us all and move us to do things. Each time, it's a little different. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Each of us experiencing that God in our own way, most likely if we're open to receiving and hosting the Holy One in different times, we'd even have more experiences and deeper relationships with God. You know, some of us tap into that sheer power and off of the awesome creation, the fury of storms, the natural occurrences, the heartbeat of the living creature who 
the zillions of breathing beings that make up life as we know it, the presence of an all-powerful God speaks to us. Many of us need that loving, kind parent-child relationship, a companion, a mentor, a good shepherd who walks beside us, someone who has felt and experienced what we humans endure, laughter, tears, triumphs, all with our God. Many of us are looking for the great wind that moves people, moves the actions of people to show mercy and compassion to others, perhaps the challenges that have been overcome by groups, perhaps the unexpected good deeds of others they see in the flowing spirit of God. This concept of Trinity is a way of explaining the unexplained, the God who lives and breathes and walks with us, the God who is active in all things, creating and recreating continually. But the key component of this Trinity doctrine that Athanasius has set before us today is faith. We have to believe that the three are independent and the three are one. It's all part of our faith. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. I'm not sure how you feel, but I, I've always found comfort in a God that's so big that I can't totally understand it. A God that's so big that I can't even conceive of what that God is going to do. That's a God that can help me. Because usually I'm pretty low when I'm looking to God. Which might be a problem in itself. Maybe I should be looking to God when I'm on top of the pile as well. And happy and safe. It's interesting, no matter how we look at it, these three in this trinity, this whole idea of God is based on love. Love for creation, love for us, love for our relationships with each other, love for a God who is, the very, who is that very thing, love. And gosh, I hate to tell you this, but once again, we're using something that nobody totally understands to describe something we can't totally understand. You know, nobody totally understands love. So how can we conceive of a God that is total love? You all know that love causes us to do things that are not quite logical. Love makes us feel in ways that we cannot describe. Love compels us to be more compassionate caring and sharing. Love fills our emptiness and love carries us through the hard times and challenges. And the only thing on this earth that I've seen that's eternal is love. Amen. Let us just take some time to bathe ourselves in that love that God that surrounds us, and even though we can't totally understand it, that loves us more than we will ever know or ever be able to conceive. Oh, Holy One, we thank you for the many miracles that have brought us to this time and this place. And even though we can't even begin to understand everything about you, we know that we love you. And we know that you love us. Help us to follow the, the, the mission in Deuteronomy to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Sometimes it's hard to love everyone around us. Sometimes it's hard to love things when they don't quite go the way we expect them to go. 
but we know that your love is involved in everything. There's nothing on this planet that you are not working to, to build or to recreate. You are a God, all-powerful, beyond all knowledge. Amen.
brothers and sisters, may the God of peace assure you. May the God of life invigorate you. May the God of the wind direct you. Go in peace and hope to transform your community and the world to the glory of God. Amen. Thank you.